evening, everyone. And thank you so much to tuning in to the event that I, Sarah, manager of Town Book Center, have been looking forward to for goodness knows two years. Um, I didn't know that I would be getting to talk to Natalie and Fook together um, at that time, but I am even more excited to have the opportunity to do so. Natalie Jenner is the author of two books, The In Instant International Bestseller, The Jane Austen Society, and the most recently released, Bloomsbury Girls. A Goodreads Choice Award runner, <laughs> award runner up for historical fiction and finalist for Best Debut Novel, The Jane Austen Society was a USA Today and number one national bestseller and has been sold for translation in 20 countries. Born in England and raised in Canada, Natalie has been a corporate lawyer, career coach, and most recently, an independent bookstore owner in Oakville, Ontario, where she lives with her family and two rescue dogs. To learn more, you can visit her on all social media platforms and at www.nataliejenner.com. Thu Chan has been a high school Latin teacher for more than 20 years while also simultaneously establishing himself as a highly sought after tattooer in the Northeast. He graduated from Bard College in 1995 with a BA in Classics and received the Kalanen Classics Prize. He taught Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit in New York at the Collegiate School and was an instructor at Brooklyn College's Summer Latin Institute. Most recently, he taught Latin, Greek, and German at the Wayne Fleet, and I could totally butcher that, a school in Portland, Maine. His 2012 TEDx talk, Grammar, Identity, and the Dark Side of the Sub Subjunctive, was featured on NPR's TED Radio Hour. His acclaimed memoir, Saigon, a misfits memoir of great books, punk rock, and the fight to fit in, received the 2020 New England Book Award for Nonfiction and the 2021 Maine Liter Literary Award. He tattoos and lives with his family in Portland, Maine. So here's my fun connection uh, to these two wonderful authors. Um, the start of the pandemic in March 2020, I was struggling mightily to read, as many of us were, and I was looking for a great nonfiction and a great fiction. And fun fact, I was born and grew up in the same town, uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, um, that Fook went to uh, school in after immigrating from Vietnam. So I anxiously read every single page looking for mention of my mother, <laughs> uh, who was a teacher at the same school at the same time. Um, and alas, their paths did not really cross. Um, but that's my connection to, to Fook. And then to Natalie, uh, her arc for the Jane Austen Society arrived with a beautiful note addressed to me, you know, sharing how, how wonderful it was. And so I'm sitting there going, these are my two favorite books of 2020. <laughs> Lo and behold, later in 2020, I find an event that the two of them wound up doing together <laughs> with the Toronto Public Library, which was a wonderful event. Um, we'll include links to it later on as well. Um, but I was blown away. I didn't realize that there was a greater connection beyond selfishly myself. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm gonna start off by asking, how did that come about to the best of your recollections? Uh, and then Fook has some questions for Natalie. Natalie, do you remember? I don't, I, I, do, I do feel like, I oh, no, I know, I know, I know. It was the Richmond, Richmond book event. Oh, my goodness. You're right. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, um, that was the first event I had booked. And it was the first of many that got uh, turned virtual during the first wave of the pandemic. So we didn't get to meet. We would have, we would have gotten to meet and hung out at the hotel lobby and like gone to dinner and done all this stuff together but instead we met virtually and yeah. it was it was interesting because he likes Jane Austen so you know he he read my book and he was very complimentary about it and I love memoir I love bios and stories of real lives I love learning through other people's mistakes <laughs> 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 for misbegotten adolescences <laughs> and I was like oh you know what this is so like my life when I was a teenager in terms of my love of culture and stories and we became fast buddies through the joys of social media yeah so I think yeah we did that event and then um and then afterwards I think I can't remember I think like one of us messaged the other yeah it's like really nice to meet you me. I'm so aggressive yeah <laughs> I need more author friends <laughs> yeah and I was like oh Natalie she seems like the kind of lady that I would I would have a cocktail with you know and uh, oh and then we and then we found out that we both named our daughters our daughters Phoebe, Phoebe. 
after um, Catcher in the Rye. Mm -hmm. Rockfield's kid sister. So yeah. really, like, it was like, that was it. I mean, once I found out hey. that, that we yeah. both had girls named Phoebe, we're like, okay, yeah. I guess we have to be best friends now. Yeah, cool. Exactly. Cool. Never meet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you'll both just have to come to the store. You know, when travel and all that kind of stuff is is really happening again and schedules align, you'll just have uh, to come to the store. I, Sarah, I actually mapped it. I'm I'm going to be in um, Carlisle next weekend, but um, we're we're it's like a little bit too far out of our way to get. To I'll see. I'll see. I'll let you know. I will message you. When are you in Carlisle next weekend? Totally unrelated to anything that we're doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Memorial Day weekend, yeah. So Saturday through Monday, I think. Okay. Because yeah. we'll be coming back from Pittsburgh on um, Sunday morning. So okay. unrelated. Right. We can, okay. we can unrelated. <laughs> let's, let's talk about this, this gem of yeah, a book. where we're all we? going to be next week if you want to find yeah. us. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. I, yeah, I don't know if I really need to be telling the whole internet that yeah, I, no, that's yeah, true. No, I <laughs> where I'm going to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got Sarah, Sarah, do you have questions for Natalie? Do you want me to just start uh, pep peppering her? Uh, I figure you go ahead and then I'll ask my questions. Um, I know uh, a couple people are watching who will hopefully have questions as well. And yeah. then we can finish up with, with mine and in Q&A. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, for those of you who have not read this, um, this is the sequel to Jane Austen Society, um, which is behind Natalie on the top shelf. Um, I am so I, I don't I don't want to ruin it. So I don't you don't need to read Jane Austen Society. I think that you will. I mean, you should. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with you. You didn't read it, and then you should read this book because it's a sequel. Um, I don't even know where to start. I guess I'll Natalie tell me about. Um, the research. So it's, it's deeply researched, but in not in a pedantic way, it's, it's researched in a way where it's like, it's clear that like you did a lot of work and I'm curious about, um, is your, is the process, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we're going to jump right into process. Cause I'm just such yeah. a nerd about it. That yeah. did you have like a story and then was the relationship between the research and the story, you know, recursive or, did you do a ton of research and then let the story bubble up from that research? And this is sort of a long winded way of asking like, where did the idea for the book come from? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I love talking about research because I, what I find fascinating with writing fiction, especially is that I think the research process can look so unique and different as opposed to a more academic um, or nonfiction approach. Because for me, my books start with my characters and the, the spark of an idea. And then I research to support where they're living, when they're living, what they want, what they're fighting for, what they're looking for. And usually what happens is that I get a spark of an idea and I start to kind of just let myself research for fun for a few months. And then when I feel like I kind of know the key where it's going to take place, when it's going to take place in the stakes, I sit down and I just start to write the story and I follow my characters. And then my characters start to do and say things. And I'm like, could they have done that in 1950? And, you know, or, oh, wait, that person just showed up. I don't know that much about that person. And then I'll like actually research while I'm writing. And the last thing to share about my process is that because I was a working mother when I wrote my first five unpublished books, I wrote from five to seven in the morning. And what that meant was I didn't have any other time during the day because I had actually full-time stay-at-home mom and I ran two businesses. So no other time to do any other creative writing. So I had to learn to creatively write and then go, wait a minute. I wonder if Daphne du Maurier ever had a story that was never discovered or just recently got discovered. Let me go research that. And then I would literally research for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, see if there was something and kind of go back into the flow and then later go really fulsomely. So it's very fluid, it's very intuitive, and it's very responsive to the needs of the story, which is why I hope when people read it, that the history is more the setting and that the, st the fiction, the story is more the driver. Yeah. And I, I yes, I, I would say a thousand percent that was true for me. You know, that said, like every five pages and they'll be like is that true like i mean it was just like sort of like like sort of not you know things that i just didn't know i'm like this this book i mean can i talk can we talk about the mummy for a second is that yeah. gonna be yeah, some, yeah. is that yeah, a spoiler yeah. i was like yeah, I, you know one, what? I have a fun fact for you guys please sarah yeah so the mummy was not readily available here in the states for a very long time 
And in April, I think the same day as the paperback uh, for Saigon, Sourcebooks with their like mystery relaunch, relaunched the mummy. Yeah. So we have it on display. Yeah. Girls at the yeah. store. So that oh, is my, that's my. So what's funny about the mummy is there is a real Chawden House library because there's a real Chawden House. And that's the setting of my first book, The Jane Austen Society. And when I started to write this book, I didn't know anything really that was going to happen. But I just moved my daughter home from residence. I She lived in a turret with Ivy. I had campus politics, campus life on my brain. I sat down that morning after we came back. I started to type. Immediately, she's getting foiled by an academic rival. And she's going to have to get a job. And she decides she's going to take out this business card and apply for a job at this bookshop. At that moment of writing, I did not know that she had a secret ulterior motive for applying for that job. Well, I so don't know that when I'm writing that. You are a pantser, not a player. Yes, totally. So then... Wait, wait, can we unpack that for your audience? So, yeah. So yeah, audience. I write by the seat of my pants. I have no idea what's going to happen. And Stephen King says, if you're not surprised what, when you're writing, how will your audience be? And that I hold true to for the way I write. That's not effective for everybody, but it works. At least I have fun. <laughs> I don't know how effective yeah. it is, but I love doing it. And um, so basically, there's a moment in the book, in the first quarter so I don't think it's a spoiler to share where Evie goes upstairs and the narrative voice and the narrators in my book are always another character like they're always they're all they're stern it's it's not my character's voices there's somebody telling you the story basically and the character's like but that's not the only reason Evie took that job and the moment I typed those words I went oh what is she doing and so then I said to my husband oh, she's looking for something she knows there's something in this bookshop and it's of a lot of value. So this is the funny part of the story about the mummy. So I look up unpublished works of significance and I discover that there was a book written in the 18th century that foretold the King, King George um, in the early 20th century and foretold a first global war. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. But it was written by anonymous. I couldn't find out anything on, you know, I was kind of like, I don't think this is quite right. And within five minutes, that led me to the mummy. And I go to walk the dog with my husband and I go, I think I found the perfect book for Evie to be looking for. And it cannot be that easy. So I spent another month researching every book published or unpublished by a woman. And the key was I had to know that it would be of value. And so, wait, so, so you wrote up to the part where you're like, Evie's looking for something. And then there's like a pause and you're writing while you do research. And then you go back to writing until you I get actually to like another kind of, chapter. yeah. And, and so, and so I kind of wrote a lot of the book without knowing what she was looking for. <laughs> because I wasn't sure it was going to be the mummy. And so I just want to say, this gives me a lot of gas, just like hearing that. <laughs> like oh, it, it totally no, worked. No, no, because, no, it's so yeah. great. It's so great. But it just like. So I think that. it's so loopy, but it, again, I have so much fun and I only write to have fun because I'm an empty nester. My husband's retired. We're at that stage yeah. in life. Right. And I'm kind of like, why am I doing this? Because it's the most fun I have. This is the most yeah. fun I have. So I'm out walking the dog with my husband and I'm telling him the problem is it has to be a book that if you found out about it, it would be worth something. Well, sure enough, if you found out if it's worth something, we have already known about it it has already become famous, right? Like if it was a missing book by Emily Bronte, we would know about it. So I want it to be real. So after about a month of research, I, one day I gave up and I said to my husband, I actually think I found the right book within five minutes and I'm going to stick with it. And I'm so glad I did because it led to a lot of other themes. It led to themes about genre and how, you know, like just, you know, the kind of the evolution of the commercialization and diversification of fiction in a way that doesn't always serve certain authors because of them being pigeonholed and I things like that. I literally have a question about that here. So ah, can we just, okay. that's such a great segue. Yeah, I, so I just, um, so I want to know what you think about, about those genre constraints. So, so you talk about it in the book and then I want to think about that in sort of like modern terms. So yeah. for the audience who's not sort of in the publishing or writing world you know you yeah. have like these like genres like uplit you know so like uplifting literature and you have like upmarket and you have like you know like horror mystery etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you have like literary you know and and i think for better or worse like i think the publishing world sort of really wants people to stay in a lane and they're yeah. like well if you're writing this genre then you're really gunning for prizes but like no sales and if you're writing in this genre, you know, you might sell a lot of books, but never get a nod for a prize or, or whatever. And, and, and 
you know, not this is not a spoiler, but you you riff on that idea with Daphne du Maurier um, about her being sort of pigeonholed as a, a romance writer. And I don't know if it's because of what she writes or if, if it's because she's a woman. I don't know. I would I would love for you just just to hear yeah. you talk about the limitations of genre, you know, which are so artificial and invented by the industry. I don't know. They why. are invented by the industry. And it's interesting because the reason I know this is because I never really paid much heed to it. But when I went through my year of aggressively rereading Jane Austen, you realize that until really the Colin Firth miniseries in 94 and Jennifer Ely, up until that moment, although she was being seen, I think, in the 20th century, starting to be seen a bit like Georgette Heyer, like a bit in the more women's space. For the first 100 years of her legacy, as many men are, as women loved her, studied her, and nobody thought of her as a woman's fiction, woman's writer, romance writer. So I found that interesting. And one of the things I wanted to do with my debut is kind of reclaim her male fandom a bit, um, because I know lots of men that love Jane Austen and, well, Folks, a prime, you know, a really great example of that. Yeah. So, I think genre. I think genre. I actually kind of blame. I don't blame. That's a strong word, but I think with movies and television in the mid in the thirties through the sixties, it, it just became clear that was so much entertainment to choose from, and you know, there was like so much being made in all areas that it was going to become really hard to find the audience and market to them. And so they've had to create these labels. What's interesting is that I, somebody was saying that my work isn't really historical fiction. They said it's more women's fiction in a historical setting. And I was like, you know what? That's a really interesting, neat way of, of saying it. That, that might be more accurate, but it's a long way of saying it. And it's not a category, you know? So they do need to find these categories. And they do want you to stay in your lane. And, they, and the industry... The industry does need, because of how, and having run a bookshop, Sarah, you can relate to this. There's so many books that come out every week. People cannot comprehend how many books are coming at you, and it never ends. So it is so hard to distinguish them from each other. And so I, I actually think in that way, the, it does serve the industry um, in helping to distinguish in this kind of really crowded marketplace. But as a writer, I just look at myself as a storyteller. And I just look at my books as character driven. And some of them are set in the present. <laughs> they were not published. The one set in the past got published. Historical fiction is really, you know, attractive and in demand and, and successful. So that's kind of, you know, how I approach it. I approach myself as a storyteller and I let my publisher deal with or, or kind of worry about the categories. Um, and I just think about my characters and what they need um, and how little to reveal about what they want as the story goes on so that I can keep the reader turning the pages because I believe I have two jobs when I write one is to keep you as constantly entertained as you as an individual can be so you may not be the right person for my book my book may not be the right person for you but if it is I want you on every page to get something from it and I want you to have hope at the end that's mm. why I write and you're and I, I found in this in um Bloomsbury Girls more than there was like a it felt a little in, and I mean this in the highest complimentary way like there's a kind of a Dickensian kind of um, oh, yeah, narrative, I love narrative that rhythm there's like a rhythm there's it's very I, I felt like like I felt like Jane Austen Society like very clearly like you know so you have a lot of like winks and easter eggs to Austen but I felt like with this one like there were many chapter ends where it felt like Dickens it was like it was like, dun, dun, dun. you're like, well, I guess I'm staying up late to read the next chapter. You know, well, like, so okay. I love that you say that because my narrator being another character does foreshadowing. And I feel bad because some people don't like foreshadowing. But for me, the foreshadowing is actually part of the wit. <laughs> I aspire to be witty. I don't know if it's funny, but it's like, you know, and a cascading chain of events from which Bloomsbury books would never recover is one of my yeah. favorite lines in the book because it's yeah. right in the half point. It's right in the midpoint of the book. And that's the point at which you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what could possibly go wrong? Like, what could go so wrong, right? Like, what's happened so far? They've had a literary luncheon with Daphne Demore. I mean, like, it's not a bomb went up. Like, what could happen, right? And I just love that line because it starts setting a stake going, yeah, you think, you think this is a quiet, cozy little thing. <laughs> Something's right. about to go down. Um, but Dickensian is very apt, actually, folk, again, because, um, and I just love that you picked up on that, because in the I was watching our mutual friend as the miniseries and I was thinking about right. Dickens while I was while I was writing this and I was thinking about how people had to write on demand 
So Trollope and Dickens and, um, you know, Elizabeth Gaskell, even, I think, you know, they, they wrote um, a section and then they sent it off and it got printed. And then you're committed to that as a storyteller. And it got printed in like a magazine journal. And then you can actually buy them on eBay. Like you can see like all like, you know, whatever it was, 20, you know, magazines. And each one has, you know, 40 pages of this Dickens book. And there, you had to wait, right, to get the next installment. But he was writing it still while those installments are out there. You so he ain't, he's yeah. not able to go back and go, <laughs> you know what? Maybe it's not the mummy. Maybe I'll pick something else. Like he doesn't get to do that the way I do. Right. You so think he I, was a pantser? You think Dickens was a pantser? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I do. I, I yeah. I do <laughs> and when I write, what I do every morning, this is people ask if you're a pantser, how do you avoid writer's block? And what I do is I treat every day as a chapter and I treat it as a beginning, middle and end with its own little arc within a larger arc of a section, within a larger arc of a whole, within the larger arc of the whole book. And when I sit down, I start writing and I go, what's going to happen today? Ooh, there's going to be, someone's going to accuse somebody of stealing their watch in the shop as I'm writing. And then I know I want to get to the end of that scene and I want there to be some mini resolution. That doesn't mean that that section is done with. And then I start the next chapter and I'll write a paragraph or two and I stop. Even if I'm having fun, I go, don't. And I leave it so that when I sit down the next day, I just pick up where I left off. Do you, and, and so in reading your um, acknowledgements, because I'm super nerdy about that kind of stuff too. Oh, I always read that. It's I, read, you know, long. I love acknowledgements. Yeah. It's like I was the kid that like read the album cover, you know, and like the liner notes. The liner like, notes. Oh, yeah. Oh, all yeah. the time. Yeah. So, um, and it seems like you, you had a cadre of people, early readers. And I'm curious about... Um, was that just, you know, your early readers, did they serve to tighten things or I guess Expand. I'm asking how, yeah, how, how substantially yeah. different was your first draft? And then once it goes through, you know, yeah. your sort of trusted readers, how different is it? How, how different is the final product? You ran everything with your memoir by your, by your wife. Is that right? Yeah. Did she read it in sections? I was trying uh, to remember that. Yeah. She would, she read it like hot off the presses, like the day that I finished. She yeah. would read it okay. right away. Yeah. But so, she was my own, only early reader. Yeah. And yeah. so with all my other books, it's always been my husband and, and then my agent. And then with this one, I wrote it during the pandemic, the first summer of 2020. And I was having so much fun writing it. And I got to the end and I gave it to my husband and it was lean. And my first oh, draft so is all he wasn't, lean. he wasn't reading it along the way. Like no, he, he didn't. You know, he's before, yeah. usually with the one I'm writing now, the next one that's coming out in a couple of years, um, I kind of gave it to him like the first half. And then he, he can say, you know, cut or bail. He's like, you know, like, oh, you know, this is, this is great. Or like, please like, don't go any further. Um, will he, will said, you read my early book too? My first draft too? I'd love to. <laughs> I love reading early drafts. I love, I love seeing the creative process because I just find it fascinating. I mean, this book is also about writing and, it, you know, both of our first books are about a love books. of books, yeah. you know? So it's really interesting, but this is also about um, a love of writing as well as a love of books. And when I was finished the first draft, I was always about half the length of the final version. Oh. And you may wonder why, you may wonder why is that? And that's because little Natalie has gotten carried away and needs to know how it's going to end. And so I have written to the end. <laughs> and then my agent comes in and his job is to say, now you've got to flesh out the midpoint to the three quarter mark because you need to make sure your reader feels like they earned that ending, that payoff. And it's because I've written quickly because I, I kind of get in a vortex, I call it. And I, I'll sometimes write like, you know, 10, 15,000 words in one weekend. Like, cause I just want to know how it's going to end. Cause I don't know how it's going to end. Are, are you writing and, scenes? Are you writing, is it sort of like scenes or is it like ex expository? Like, I mean, you do know what I mean? Like, Oh no, there it's, it's the book. And none no. of it, and none of it gets, it, none of it gets deleted or changed. So those words stay. Yeah. But what happens is I decided I knew it was lean. I want to make sure that it was working so I gave it to um, five trusted woman author friends and they all read that draft and, or some of them read the second draft and their job was to say to me, here's what I loved. I kind of wish this couple got together. Um, I didn't understand this relationship and I want more of X. And so then I go back and I write a second or third draft 
And then my agent and I submit that to my editor and then my editor and I do a couple more drafts. And each one is just expanding themes, scenes, characterization, detail, setting, and it's just making it sing. But mm. it never, the first draft never gets messed around with. Like I don't delete anything, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. No. So I'm, I'm curious Can about, I, yes, yeah, yeah, please, yeah, 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 Sarah, yeah. So, I was lucky enough to get uh, the manuscript um, of Bloomsbury Girls last September. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious of, because usually when I get a manuscript, I don't go back and I read the finished one. And so I'm curious if, if much changed between. No, 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 what you got is what you got is the final version I gave my agent before we copy edited it. So there's typos and there's, you know, but yeah, no, I just, um, I had this great group of women authors that I hadn't had when I read the Genesis Society because I wasn't a writer, a published writer yet, and I didn't think I was going to write again. So I thought I would take advantage of these wonderful brains in my life. And and they were amazing. And, and one of them, Laurel Ann Natras, who does um, the Austin Prose blog, Sarah, have you heard of Austin Prose? It's a great Jane Austen blog. She, she really pushed me on Vivian and Alec, and I was really glad she did. Um, and you mean that relationship didn't exist? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was you no. Know, it well, it did, but it wasn't. It wasn't fleshed like you. You found out about it, but then there wasn't much more. Mm. And so she really kind of, she kind of made me really consciously understand that, you know, that there was more there to be parsed and to be to be conveyed. The last thing to share with you guys is that. So when I first told my husband the idea of a bookshop where the women want to take it over from the men. He's like, you're not going to do a male bashing book, are you? Like, because you're not like that. You love men. And I went, no, 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 honey. Like everyone, oh, everyone in the shop will be a good human being who's just not in the right job for their skills because that's a former career coach in me. And, uh, and I said, you know, just have faith, bear with me. So at the end of the book, I really wanted to be a book about people um, finding the opportunities that match their skills and talents the best, right? Again, former career coach in me. So I'll just tell you guys, if I have anybody end up together romantically and my editor, my agent, two men, big softies were like, oh, can somebody end up together? My editor wanted me to put a cat in the book. He's like, can't there be an animal, like a cuddly thing? And like, I was just like, so my editor was the reason why the book was going to end the second last chapter my editor is the reason why I went back and I sat down one morning last March, which Sarah, you have in your manuscript. And I wrote, and I just, Oh my God, it was the most fun I've ever had. It's now my favorite chapter. So it's the last chapter of the book. And I had so much fun writing that chapter and I decided yet again, and I just wrote an article for lit hub about happy endings. I, and I, decided, great. I, went, great. I went yet again, I am going to give everybody everything they deserve. And you just feel like this puppet master, you know, and I just, I never had more fun in my life. And I'm so glad my editor asked, asked for that chapter. So do you, I'm curious. Um, I don't think that it's a, you know, and I, when I, I don't think it's a male bashing book at all, you know, but it is clearly, um, you female know, it, empowerment. yeah, it is for sure. For sure. You know, but I, I kind of bristled. A little bit. I don't know why I'll have to talk to my therapist about this later. You know, when you called your writing like women's fiction, like I, well, you know, I don't, I don't actually, but it is called sure. that. No, so I, know. Like, I don't. Yeah. Like, what does that even I, mean? You know, like I know I'm, I don't, I, I, it's just because it's about women, but I would never call Brides Have Revisited men's fiction or The Heart of the Matter men's fiction. Like, you know, I wouldn't look at it that way. But again, it, it is something that serves the modern reader in this particular sure. crowded industry. But I don't look at my work as women's fiction. I, in the Jane Austen Society, had more male characters, more male voices, more one on one male dialogue scenes. And I had a male audiobook narrator. But it's, it is, it is categorized by the industry. Yeah, as women's fiction. That's so strange. I mean, and I feel like at the end of the day, I don't, I don't know if that, I, I agree with you that from a publishing perspective, it, it serves to target, your, you know, your marketing more precisely. And also like, you, you know, you're sort of using a sledgehammer to do something very delicate. And it, and it I, I, I think of all the people who will not necessarily cross the threshold to read your book. Because, oh, of, I know. because of the marketing. Yeah. Which is yeah. too bad. I know, I know. So. Sarah, what do you what do you think about that concept of women's fiction? Do you, as a bookseller, bookstore manager, do you have a viewpoint on that? I do. I have I have many complex viewpoints on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think 
I think, so our store, we used to have women's fiction as a separate genre. We got rid of it. We integrated it into regular fiction. We have literary women's fiction, uh, historical fiction, and like grand family sagas. Um, yes. Are yeah. All in our general, general fiction. And never has anyone come up to me and said, where is your women's fiction section? Uh, but people frequently ask me where my historical fiction section is. So we have thought about like pulling out the historical fiction and I would definitely put both of your books in the historical fiction section because that is frequented, you know, by people of all genders, races, walks of life, mm -hmm. identities, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. You. Um, yeah. But we made a very conscious choice not to draw that line in the store ourselves. And yeah. I stand by that decision, you know. No, day. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a really productive initiative. And I do, I do wish that things could maybe move more, you know, towards that. I know that three of my biggest sort of like champions happen to be these, you know, these three male um, bloggers who also all really like the Jane Austen Society. So sometimes folk, I kind of just hope that the Jane Austen Society having resonated with so many men as well as women will ho hopefully carry people forward. Um, but, I, but I take your point. And, you know, my editor, my agent, like people in the industry will have said to me, like, you will lose, if we categorize it like this, you will lose people. If we do mm. the cover like this, you will lose people, mm. right? Yeah. But, so they're, they're, everyone's very conscious of what they're doing. Um, yeah. As a writer with my next book, I'm trying very hard to be de I'm dealing with complex historical po political themes in the context of the movie or entertainment industry and I'm again just trying really hard to just follow human beings um, of all backgrounds and not get fixated on a particular audience I'm very lucky to be published twice now and mm. I can now write for an audience that I can picture like mm -hmm. I, I yeah. So can, I want to, and I had a question. But I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please, no. No, please. no, no, no. I was going to say, I just, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to have yeah. been published twice. I've got readers. I kind of have a sense of what they like. Like today, I went to sign books at the bookstore, and the woman at the bookstore was halfway through my book, and she said, "I just know right away it's you when I read when I read your writing. I go, that's Natalie Jenner. Like nobody else writes like that. And that to me is the bar none highest compliment as a writer." Mm. And I, and I, that is my focus. Yeah. But anyways, what were you going to ask? No, no. So um, somebody had said to me, it was a flip remark, but I thought it was funny. And I've thought about it since, you know, oh, anybody can write a book, but not everybody can write a second book. So I, I wonder what your, what, what that sophomore book adventure was like for you. But it sounds like having written five books previously that were unpublished, it, yeah. this, may, this did feel like your second book, but it definitely was not your second book. Right. So I don't Yeah. Know. I think the only, the only, kind of maybe pressure I felt was that I sold it to my publisher on the basis of seven page prologue and a character outline. So that's, yeah, that's fun. So then you hand it in with a few months left before your deadline. You're like, gosh, I hope they like this. <laughs> Otherwise we're all in trouble. Um, <laughs> I actually think that for me, um, that, that was the, that was the element that was different because of the Jane Austen society. I wrote it purely for myself and my husband and never planned to query it or send it out. I, I really did write it for myself. So this was a different experience on that basis, but I was very lucky because I'd had an earlier work that I wrote uh, the year before the Jane Austen society came out. But after I sold the Jane Austen society had been um, put on the shelf by my publisher, it was set in modern times. And so when I wrote this book, I'd already written another book and it can't go worse than not having it bought. Right. So I was yeah. kind of like, okay, like how bad can it go? Right. So um, I was really lucky with this one. Um, the, the third book, the one I'm working on now, it's been a completely different experience. It's oh, wait, so been, what can you say about your third book? Is it so the, the third book it, carries oh, the forward. trilogy? Yeah. It's going to be like, so it carries forward Vivian from Bloomsbury girls and it carries her forward into the mid 1950s where she's going to for a variety of reasons go to Rome and work as a script doctor at Chinichita the movie studios and she's going to join a group of expatriate Brits and Americans um, who are in the film industry and it's really about people reckoning with decisions choices and loss from the war in, in that way that we have to in real life, which is that it sometimes catches up with you later or it sneaks up on you or there's a reckoning left to be done. And it's also romantic and it's full of history and there's some action. I, again, tried with this sort of Dickensian approach. I try to put a little bit of everything into it again. 
It which sounds like you I, have to do a research trip to Rome, huh? It was, uh, you know what, I, I love Rome so much. I've been several times. And one of the great things about writing fiction is deciding what you miss the most and going, I'm going to go write it. I'm going to write it into being. So I, I missed Chawton with my first book and I missed bookshops with my second. And I missed traveling and new experiences and meeting, you know, new people in person. So that's book three. So that how sounds lucky amazing. am I? Yeah. yeah. Do we so get to see a little of Mimi if we're going back to some some filming and stuff like that? Oh, I um, I I, I actually, I, I need to know. I need to know. Like, for, can you talk about what you're working on? Because every time we <laughs> message each other, you're working on something else that is so intimidatingly cool to me that oh, I'm always God. like, well, "Why do I even tell him what I'm doing?" <laughs> no, 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 no. Picture books, right? Yeah, yeah. So I um, so I I should have been working on a book, but um, I ended up working um in the writer's room for HBO for about eight months. <laughs> uh, so, so that happened. Uh, and so, so I don't think I'll, I don't think I'm, uh, I don't think I'm violating any non-disclosure agreements. So HBO probably only, they green light 2% of the yeah. projects that they develop. So, you know, we finished up like our work, you know, it was like a lot of zoom because all the other writers were in Los Angeles. So I was zooming from Maine on the East coast. And then at the end of the stint, you know, they were just like, okay, thanks for your service. I was like, is this show going to get made or what? Like, so I, I have no idea. So, um, and then in the midst of that, like right when that ended, um, someone approached me, uh, an illustrator, um, Pete Oswald and his, and his agent approached me and asked me if I wanted to work on a project that he was working on and needed a writer. So I wrote a, a children's book um, and then Harper Collins bought it and said, we actually want the two sequels also so i hope you want to write two more so but pete is so busy you know he wrote like the underwear dragon and then he's got like the vegetable the the vegetable series and he's an amazing amazing illustrator um and so he's so busy that the first opening that we have in his his release schedule is 2024 and i turned the book in in 2021 so <laughs> Um, but, um, now I'm working, I'm taking notes on a novel, so I'm, I'm going to work, cool. I'm going to start writing a novel this summer. So I'm so yeah. glad I can't wait. Okay. Yeah. Which nobody wants me to write, but I'm going to write it anyway. Like I, <laughs> so we'll see. I want to read it. I'll read it. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Um, Natalie, can I ask a question? Uh, Sarah, do we have time? Can I ask her? Oh, absolutely. Ask her? Um, I'm here as long as you guys want to be. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious what what is the conversation or what 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 are the questions that you would want your readers to ask because of your book well i think because of bloomsbury some, yeah yeah what's something that's really important to me is that i know that everything good that's ever happened to me in my life has happened because of somebody else and it's happened because they knew what i wanted or they liked me or they cared about me or I had been able to help them and there's this I don't know synergy that happens with other human beings and I was saying in an interview last week that I, I think the more that you give to others and the more that you connect with others the more social you are frankly which is hard to do um, in a pandemic but hard to do for a lot of people it increases your chance of good luck and good fortune in life and I think the question I'd want people to ask themselves while they're writing is you know is there a is there a way for me to approach something in my life right now in a way where i could be maybe a bit or i need to be a bit more open to risk or connection or exposure or vulnerability in a way that these characters are because the characters in my book in making the decisions to confide in each other to tell each other when they're upset to let each other know what's really going on um, to have the confidence that other people are there for them. Um, all of those things, I think, are things that it's very easy to lose sight of, especially as we get older or as life gets harder. And I think I would want people to ask themselves, am I doing things in a way that these characters are? Because as a former career coach, again, I tried very much to instill in my characters you know, some of those messages about how important it is to connect. I mean, one of my favorite books is Howard's End by Ian Forster and the epigraph is Only Connect. And that is a book where 
connection between people from different strata of society, but also within a family um, is just so critical to us all being able to move ahead and to, to realize the life in a way that's as positive and joyful as it can be does require others. And I want people to ask if, you know, if there's ways that they could be coming at things maybe a little differently. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I love it. It's a, that's so, that's so marvelous. Um, I had a question about all the fashion description. I really noticed it. Like I was like, wow, Natalie, you fashion now. Like, I <laughs> love like fashion. there's these beautiful descriptions of what everyone is wearing every yeah. time. And I, it was like, it was very, it was pretty great. It was pretty great. You know, like, black turtleneck with a pencil skirt and like you know like these like mm-hmm. woolen coats and yeah it's really like everyone looks really um very handsome and beautiful i i love i love fashion and i i love the fashion from the sort of 40s and 50s because i feel like i was talking with brooke lee foster has uh, a book coming out next week sarah on gin lane from simon schuster it's really good and it's set in the 50s in um basically montauk in an artist kind of colony and it's um it's again, it's, it's that time. It's a little later than, you know, it's the late fifties, but I feel like it was the last time that people dressed up to go out, you know? And I feel that that gives a, just a romance to like the everyday life. Um, and I also really love that fashion. I love old film. So I'm very attuned to, do you remember like those crazy Doris Day Rock Hudson movies and she would wear like the matching pillbox hat with the little bolero jacket and then like the wrap dress under like I just love that stuff eat it up and I th- honestly think that's why I'm writing in the 50s again because in my new book in the draft I have cameos from um like you know Sophia Loren Ava Gardner you know and I get to write about what they're wearing and it's that's fun <laughs> we talked about marvelous Mrs. Maisel for a minute do you watch that Natalie no I just Sarah? started watching it I just yeah. started watching it Sarah have you seen it sorry I it's, muted myself yeah. um, all but the last season but yeah. I just style yeah. icon <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. enjoy Absolutely. it's incredible yeah. so incredible um yeah Awesome. Do we, are, is this where we, are there, is there Q and A for us to yes. tackle Sarah? So there's, I, I kind of combined uh, my own with some, some Q and A um, just to Great. You know, mix it up a little bit. Uh, so I have questions for both of you uh, and some are questions for both of you together and some are specific um, to one or the other of you. Um, but Natalie, since you just mentioned, you know, including Sophia Loren and everything like that, what, was the inspiration including both real people along with, you know, your historical characters? You know, it's funny. I, I don't know. At first, I didn't remember where it came from. And then it was only because there's another book in between this and the Jane Austen Society that it was a long ago conversation. But I remember now, and I just remembered it a week ago, because someone asked me a similar question, was that my agent had said to me, maybe with your next book, if you stay in the literary space, you could deal with people loving a writer or loving books but perhaps that person's still alive and this is how it works with your agent and your editor they plant seeds and they just start to grow you know and then two years later you think you're so brilliant for coming up with something but really what happened was and my audience that's watched me talk at all like even once will now know the story was that i was watching a netflix documentary two months before the pandemic started on peggy guggenheim and in the middle of the of the show somebody mentions that she and Samuel Beckett had had this torrid affair and that they had holed up at the Ritz in Paris in the late thirties for four or five days. And they didn't open their hotel room door once except to a tray of sandwiches. And I actually still have the text where I sent to my agent, which is like, I have to write about this one day. And I, I actually for months was thinking, how do I write about this? So then when I thought about writing the book set in 1950, I was like, well, where was Samuel Beckett? Well, where was Peggy? Um, and so it was really fun because I was like, oh, I can fit them in. So that is why they're, t- that's why they're both in the book. Cause I wanted to be able to put that line in my book. And that is how loopy I am when I write. I love it. I also love how you, you tease a little bit with the fact that, um, British aristocracy may be known by many different names, depending on who you're talking to. Um, so I won't give anything away, yeah. but I, I remember jumping up and down at one point and being like, 
it's I can't I can't tell you it's one of those little gifts that you get was when I discovered that there yeah. that this person was called by other names and I just went oh I didn't know that I just thought I was just gonna I have didn't to show know up that. yeah I didn't know that I didn't know that and so then I was like oh this is so great and this is another one of those like text my agent going you won't believe this and actually on that note the last thing very quickly to say is that I was researching Peggy Guggenheim because I'm going to put her in my book I've started writing my book. I'm still not quite sure how it's going to end. And then I find out in one of my random research Wikipedia moments that she had worked in the late teens of the 20th century around 1919 in the one of the first earliest all female owned and operated bookshops in Manhattan. And literally I read that and she's already in my book. And I, I called my agent and he said, these are the gifts. These are the gifts that fall in their lap. And in that moment, I went, and now I know how my book is going to go. And it, and and I had already had her in the book. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so this one is for Fook. Uh, how did you get into tattooing? Oh, yeah. Gosh, you know, just hanging out with all the kids my parents told me not to hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, yeah, that's the that's my snarky version. The, short, the shortest version is that I was getting tattooed um, all through college. And then right at the end of graduate school, uh, the guy who was tattooing me um, just said, you know, this was 1996. And he said, hey, you know, we're looking for an apprentice. Why don't you apply? You seem like you're really into the lifestyle. <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay. So I just, I applied for a tattoo apprenticeship in New York City and I got it. And then I moved to New York and started learning how to tattoo. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and then this one is also for you kind of jumping off of, you know, Natalie is writing about real people who are long gone. You obviously are writing about real people who are still here. Um, what was it like, you know, navigating that? Was there anything, you know, that you cleared with people first? Um, you know, obviously you're writing about public school. I know some of the people that you mentioned. So I was just curious how you approached, you know, writing about people that you, you saw. Yeah. Met. So, um, you know, I think, um, and Nadia, it's, you know, I think you, this might be true for you too. You know, I think like when I'm, when I'm writing and producing, um, I'm writing just for myself, like, and it doesn't, you know, and then, and then when in the editing process, then you open the door and you think about your reader. But I think in the gener the generative process for me is like, I don't care about anybody but myself and the story that I want to tell. Um, and then <laughs> further down the line, at least with memoir, there's a, there's a lawyer who reads through it <laughs> and then tells you to take things out because you're going to get sued. That didn't happen a ton. Um, I did change the names of all minors who in my book. Um, so I feel like if you were an adult, you know, it, yeah. your real name is in the book is, you know, and then if you're related to me, your real name is in the book, but you know, just to protect my friends and people who did mm -hmm. not ask for their stories to be revealed. Um, everybody's names, were changed but you know that said um you know i think like anybody in our town who like grew up at the same time like the descriptions are not different so i think like a lot of people are like i know exactly who all yeah. these kids are yeah i at least knew all of the geographical locations yes <laughs> um, yes Mon bottom road was just driving down there on thursday like went out my dad still lives in carlisle so I was oh wow visiting yeah. him and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and yeah there's, there's a lot of Mortons still still in Carlisle who are never leaving, um, which it's nice to go back a couple times a year. And then I'm like, I'm going back to Philly now. I'll see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one is for Natalie. Uh, so were there any parts of your own indie bookstore that made their way into Bloomsbury Girls? And if so, what were they? I think, again, I didn't really process it when I was writing it. But I think that looking back, I was kind of vicariously experiencing, you know, some of the moments where I was like, let's give away a tote bag or let's do this. So I, I didn't have them make the exact same decisions, but I did try and have them kind of always go, is there, is there a new way to present this or a new way to attract, you know, the consumer? Um, but one of the, one of the things, like I did throw, you know, events and I was, I was very, very conscious when I threw events in the store. Like I would like, I'd have them catered and I wouldn't make any money. <laughs> I was just like, I was just going to do things a certain way. Cause it was my own shop. I could do whatever I wanted. Um, so I, I was channeling that energy of 
trying to give, you know, an experience to the consumer. And that's what I wanted the woman in the book to be conscious of, whereas the men had been doing these jobs for so long and they were much more in a bit of a groove right so it's a bit of a do-over for sure from from my own bookshop but there was nothing specific to 2016 book selling that you know would have translated exactly yeah um so this one is for both of you uh i have a new obsession with uh authors creating playlists um, actually, thanks to Natalie <laughs> and the Jane Austen Society, and you have both done that for your books. Um, so what was the inspiration for creating the playlist and how did you make decisions about what to include? Wait, Natalie, you have a playlist? I didn't know. I'm so sorry. I didn't know you had a playlist, Natalie. Yeah. I have one for, for each of my books. They're, they're very, they're very small. I, my very quickly, my inspiration was I wanted to share with anyone that liked my writing the kind of music that I listen to when I'm trying to write or be inspired. I just thought that would be a nice thing to share. If you liked the book, you, you probably would like this kind of music. So with the Jane Austen Society, my playlist is a lot of beautiful movie soundtrack music um, from Jane Austen adaptations um, and other similar types of movies. But with the Bloomsbury Girls, I went with my favorite jazz standards and um sort of beginning blues and things like that from sort of the 40s through the 50s i want it to be the music that you would actually hear on a wireless in a london bookshop in the 1950s so i was trying to create so that was the raison d'etre for that and fuck what tell me about your playlist because i can only imagine because you have so much great music mentioned in your yeah, book so much music in the book so yeah yeah it was it was just like a my fa i think it was like my favorite or most influential 20 songs from my high school years, yeah. essentially. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, yeah. Wait, can I just it's a sidebar. Natalie, is like the coffee, is the coffee cart thing? Is that a real I mean, I, I assume it's yeah, a real thing. I, I really was I was struggling because I was like, if this doesn't exist, I'm in trouble. So I was doing, <laughs> I was doing a lot of because it just came out. Like this is one of those moments, right? So I'm like, hey, let's go get a coffee from Johnny's cart. And I'm like, oh god johnny better be able to have a cart <laughs> like well, what am i gonna do because i really don't like the lawyer in me does not like changing things right i was like i don't want to make it they go to a cafeteria down the road I, I want them to be doing our version of the starbucks you know coffee chat on but, the bench so is that a thing is that a yeah a thing so i looked it up so they actually because this is london england right they actually in the in the 30s 40s and 50s would have little mini wagons basically on wheels and they would have like those huge metal um you know boiling water dispenser with the faucet and they would have like um kerosene whatever to keep it warm under and they would not have styrofoam cups yet necessarily in some of the photos i was finding they would often use creamware they would often use you know like mugs and like take it back and probably dip it in just like hot water and like serve again um but yeah it, it exists I, i'll send you a photo book because it's they're yeah. adorable they're adorable and sometimes like there would be like two women like in the 1930s there was one of the two women they were literally wearing like the white hats with the black bow and like the apron and they're standing at a train station with this cart it's really cool it's amazing thank you for that <laughs> oh that's awesome well, our last two questions are always the standard of what are you working on next, which you've already given us both teasers for. Thank you so much. I am so excited for both. Um, and then the other is what are you reading right now? A lot of 1950s books about Fellini and <laughs> just, I just, I, when I write, this is the thing I don't like about being a writer. There's only one thing I don't like about being a writer. Only one. And that is that I find it hard to read fiction when I'm writing creatively because I'm very porous. I think it's because I'm so intuitive and I write by the seat of my pants. So I absorb everything, right? And so if you talk to me and we have a conversation, like something you say, like a, a version of that could end up in dialogue the next day. So I actually kind of really introvert a bit when I'm writing and I really don't read anything except I read a lot of New Yorkers and nonfiction and things where I know that if I borrow or steal, it will be conceptually and it won't be someone's style or word choice or syntax. I don't want to, you know, borrow from another writer. I, I would hate to do that. So right now I'm actually reading a lot on Italian cinema um, and then like refugee camps during the Second World War. Books about pretty heavy um, themes. Yeah, nothing, nothing really 
um, I think something that anybody else would right now really need to kind of know about. Um, so Fook, what about you? Um, I just read for my book club, uh, Beneficence by Meredith Hall. Um, she's, uh, she lives part of the time here in Maine and then part of the time in California, but it was beautiful, like beautiful, yeah. heartbreaking book. So I highly recommend, um, yes. Well, those are, those are all of the audience questions and my questions, though I, I could go on, go on and on for ages because this has just been such a treat to finally have the two of you here and to be doing this event. Um, but thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everybody.